Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again. Everybody say again. With Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. And Ishbi Benab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishia, the son of Zeruah, secured him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. Will you put verse 16 up for me one more time and just leave it up the remainder of the service? And Ishbabinah, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. I want to preach a little while this morning from the subject of the enemy's new sword. The enemy's new sword. I want you to know I believe there's nothing more powerful than when a man finds his place in the kingdom of God. I believe there's nothing more powerful than when a woman finds her place in the power of God and in the kingdom of God. I believe that when you find your place in God, your life reaches a new level of blessing. It reaches a new level of peace. It reaches a new level of power. There's something beautiful when somebody finds their place, their reason for being on planet Earth. One of the reasons depression is rampant and suicide is on the rise is you have many people that have never found their place in God. They go through life and they feel like they have no purpose. They go through life and they feel like they have no destiny. If you ask a five-year-old kindergarten class what you want to be when you grow up, some will say an astronaut, some will say a pro wrestler, some will say a NASCAR driver, some will say an NFL football player. But ask that same group when they're 18 years of age, what do you want to be? And they'll say, I don't know. Because somewhere between age 5 and age 15, life had done beat their dreams out of them. People had done talked them down and dumbed them down and made them believe that they had no place and had no purpose. And we've never seen a more disgruntled generation than we see right now. We've never seen hopelessness in the eyes of so many as we see right now. Simply because people have become convinced because of everything coming against them that they have no place. If you feel like you have no place in life, it's easy to check out. There are many people that feel like they have no place because of the opinions of other people or because of past mistakes or because of present struggles and they think, surely God could have no place for me. For in my passion and my heartbeat and the heartbeat of this church is for you to know that with everything in us, we believe God Almighty has a place for you in the body of Christ. If you believe God has a place for everybody, I need you to give him a praise break about right now. That includes everything. Everybody I'm preaching to, there's a place for you. Nothing more powerful than a man in his place. When God made Michael Jordan, he made a basketball player. If you say LeBron's better, you're crazy. Anybody that got to watch Jordan play in his heyday knows Jordan's the best. Somebody should say amen. He earned his championships. He didn't buy them. Michael Jordan, when God made him, he made a basketball player. That was his place. When God made Dale Earnhardt, he made a NASCAR driver. I can't get no help in here. Even when he would go around Bristol, half the crowd would be cheering for him. The other half would be telling him he was number one with the wrong finger. But when he died, it's a part of NASCAR died with him. Because Elvis Presley was born to sing. Can't get no help in here. It's obvious that gift was placed in him. And when you see people doing what God put in them to do, it's really powerful if they do it for the right reasons and do it in the right thing. Elvis had the right gift. He just had it in the wrong location. As surely as there's nothing more powerful than a man in his place, there's nothing more dangerous than a man in his wrong place. As surely as God has a place for me, the enemy would love to get me in the wrong place, the wrong location. Canaan helped me out the other day, and I was able to tell him about a story. We had preached on a Sunday morning, and like nine souls had got saved that Sunday morning. The Spirit of God had flowed in a mighty way. I felt the power of God on me. I left that service saying, Ooh, God moved in a mighty way. And that was back when Jake and Dylan loved pro wrestling. 
and the, the pro wrestling had come to Johnson City. And so we was going to celebrate, you know, take them to Johnson City that night and let them watch the pro wrestlers. And it was, you know, we was having a great time. The only problem was I accidentally gave Bobby an energy drink right before we walked in. And an energy drink to Bobby is like water to a gremlin. Don't do it. So we go in, we sit down. I'm just wanting to enjoy the wrestling match, you know. And Bobby decides he's going to cheer for the bad guy. And what Bobby didn't understand was the people we were around thought it was real. It was their Super Bowl. And when one wrestler come out that everybody hated, Bobby started saying, that's my boy. Get him, our truth Get him. And then when the good guy came out and everybody started cheering, Bobby started booing him. And then there was some people sitting right behind us, and I heard them say, I'm about to bust that bald-headed boy right in the back of the head. And I look at Bobby, and I'm like, and he thinks I'm just embarrassed. He's just embarrassing me. So Bobby takes it to another level. He starts cheering even more for the bad guy. Well, I see this one woman, and I, she, she, was a, she was a healthy woman. She stood up, and her boyfriend stood up with her, and they were commencing to bust him in the back of the head. And Dylan and Jake turned around and saw him, and Bobby's so caffeinated, he don't even know what's getting ready to go on. So right before they split his head wide open, I have to turn around and act like I'm some kind of taekwondo ninja and scare the fire out of them, and they left. I didn't touch them. I just made them think I would. Help me, Jesus. And when they left, I turned around to Bobby, and I was like, will you please shut your mouth? And I thought, this morning I was preaching and nine people got saved. Here it is a few hours later. I'm in Johnson City, and I'm about getting a fight that's better than what's going on in the wrestling ring. The whole difference was location. Sunday morning I was in the right place. Sunday evening I was in a place that could have got me in trouble. See, God can get you in the right place. He can bring the right thing out of you. But if the enemy can get you in the wrong place, the wrong things can come out of you. See, when you get in church among the people of God, you're in the right place, baby. God can soften your heart. God can touch you. God can minister to you. God can make you dream again. But if you let the enemy drive you out of your place, you'll get in the wrong place. And when you get in the wrong place, the wrong emotions start growing in you. The wrong thoughts start meditating in your mind. The wrong feelings start erupting in you. See, when you get in the house of God and you begin to praise, you feel something good. But you go down to the club and you start dancing to that music and getting around all them crazy people. Other emotions come out of you. See, so many times what comes out of you is determined not by you, but by the environment you place yourself in. I've got to be in an environment of faith. I've got to be in the environment of God. I have to be around people that have the Holy Ghost living in their life in this season. The enemy would love to get you in the wrong place. The enemy would love to disconnect you from the things of God because the enemy knows when you're in your place, everything you need is going to be supplied to you. That when you're serving God and seeking his kingdom, all those things that he tries to worry about will be added to you daily. So the enemy knows he can try to lie to you when you're in the right place. But there's certain things he can't do to you when you're in the right place with God. Therefore, it becomes a job of the enemy to dislocate you, to disjoint you, to get you out of place, to get you separated from the people that love you, to get you separated from the people that are praying for you. That when hard times come, that's when the enemy comes and he tries to drive you out of the presence of God and drive you out of the house of God. What I'm trying to tell somebody is if it's been harder than it's ever been, it's because you're closer than you've ever have been. If you've been fighting more devils and crying more tears, I dare you to give God a praise. That means you're almost there, baby. David was a man that found his place. His father didn't think there was a place for him because of his background. His, his brothers didn't think there was a place for him because of his background. But when David got in the presence of Samuel, that oil flowed, and Samuel said, you have a place in God. This outcast, this overlooked, this nobody in the eyes of his family, God said, I have a place for you. 
I dare to pronounce that over everybody I'm preaching to today. My God has a place for you. You might have been overlooked and you didn't fit in with them. The reason you didn't fit in with them is because you have a special place in him. Sometimes you ought to praise God for the people that walked out of your life. Because if they hadn't walked out of your life, you wouldn't be where you are today. David found his place in God and the anointing began to erupt in his life. The, his legend began to grow. The fame of David began to surpass that of anybody that had predicated him. He was the man. He was the one everybody wanted to be like. And David rose to prominence. There were pain. There was tears. There were mistakes. But one thing was certain. David never worshipped a false god. Yes, he had weaknesses. Yes, he did some horrible things. He had some bad seasons, but David had found his place in God. And because he had found his place in God, even when he messed up, God had a way of turning it around. That even when he went the wrong way, God had a way of straightening it out. Have you ever had God make some things right for you that if he wouldn't, it would have messed you up? What I love about God is even when I go the wrong way, he loves me enough to get me back on the right path. I can't get no honest help in here, but that's how good God is. And God was good to David. And David was so thankful to God for how God had blessed him. David was the giant killer. David was the one that stood up when everybody else was afraid. But because he didn't spend his time watching CNN and watching Fox News, he spent his time on the backside of a field giving worship unto God. See, the reason some of your faith is diminished is you're listening more to the sound of the world than you are the sound of God Almighty. I can't get no help in here. I got rebuked by my phone before I come out here to preach to y'all. Because this new phone I got, it's a smart aleck. It gave me a notification that I was averaging 58 minutes a day on my screen. That means one hour a day I was averaging on my screen. One hour that could have been doing something positive. One hour that could have been a blessing. One hour that I could have been reading. And I put my phone down and I said, the devil is a liar. I'm tired of seeing what this one says or that one says. I opened up the Bible and I said, God, what do you have to say this morning? One hour. What happens in your mind, in your emotions, in your body when you give one hour a day to something positive? When you give one hour a day to something that feeds you? But what would happen in your body if you gave one hour each day to drinking as much liquor as you could drink, by ingesting as much drugs as you could drink, or as much drugs as you could take? Then you would see the negative effects. If I give an hour a day to God, it's going to show up in my life. Mm. But if I give an hour of my day to the wrong thing, guess what? It's going to show up in my life. If I give an hour of my day to being mad at somebody, it's going to show up. But if I give an hour of my day to saying, God, I just believe you to bless, I believe you to touch, I believe you to heal, that's going to show up in me. What I give my attention to is going to filter through me. And there's a war going on right now for the attention of young people. There's a war going on right now for the attention of the body of Christ. There's a distracting spirit that's been released on people to where it's like they can't focus on nothing. It's like they can't enjoy anything. And it, they're, they're, the life has got you looking at the wrong thing. And I can't be focused on the right, wrong thing and expect the right thing to happen in my life. I'm tired of worrying about the bad thing. I've got more to praise him for than I've got to worry. He woke me up this morning. He started me on my way. He woke my wife up. He woke my kids up. I've got a church to pastor. You're alive this morning. You ought to give God a praise and drive any fear out of this place right now. I promise you, no matter what's going on out there in your life, you've got more to praise him for than you got to worry about. The question is, what will you give your time and your attention to? David primarily gave his attention to God. As I told you, there were lapses in his judgment. There was weaknesses in his moral character. But David knew when he messed up not to run from God. He knew to run to God. Therefore, David became a powerful man. And the Bible said David was a man after God's own heart. And David, he started out, what rose him to prominence was fighting the Philistines. And it wasn't just one fight. 
By the time we start in 1 Samuel 16, he was fighting a Philistine. By the time we get to the end of his life, near the end of his life in 2 Samuel 21, guess what? He's still fighting Philistines. There's some things you're going to fight seasonally all your life. There's some, it ain't like you're going to have one fight with the devil and then it's over and the rest of your life is peachy. There's some things you'll battle from time to time all your life. Now, there's some things God will take out of your life never to return. But everybody I'm preaching to has a Philistine you deal with. That you love God, but every now and then you still got to fight that battle. That you're on your way to heaven, but every now and then you have to fight that depression. Or you have to fight that, 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 that tendency. You have to fight that struggle that you have a hard time talking about. The Bible time and time again said, and the Philistines made war yet again. And the Philistines made war yet again. There's some things when I came to God, he took away forever. But there's other things that I've had to fight from time to time and from season to season. It doesn't mean God's not with me. It just means that's a Philistine in my life. And the God that gave me victory in the last season, he going to give me victory this season. Come on, somebody. God ain't brought you this far to fail you now. But in this story, the Philistines come up again. And no longer is David an 18-year-old boy with good breath in him and strong muscles. No longer is he the 30-year-old that ascended to the throne that looked like a movie star. No longer was he the 40-year-old that found himself in mischievousness but still had a strong body. At this time in the text, David has got older. His dark reddish hair had turned gray. His muscles had begun to fade. He's like a Bob Seger song against the wind he's older now but still running against the wind all my redneck folks saying I know what you're saying right there preacher he's older now but he's still running against the wind he's still battling he's still struggling he ain't got the energy he ain't got the vitality but he still got to deal with the enemy but there are seasons in your life you may deal with the enemy one way but in other seasons you may, may need to deal with him another way all through the Bible, God never gave them the same tactic for victory every time, which teaches us not to depend on the tactic, depend on the God that gives us the way out. And the Bible said that David, he ascended up to the mount. He was taking it, but something happened on the way up. David got weary. David got tired. David got faint. And I don't care who you are, how big a Bible you pack, how much you love God and how strong you are. There are times in life, can I be real this morning? There are times in life we all get weary. There are times in life we all get tired. There are times in life we say, I just can't take one more thing, Lord. I can't handle one more bad phone call. I can't handle one more battle. I can't handle one more person coming against me. I can't handle one more family calamity. I can't, I can't handle no more bad news. And even though David had got to the top of the mountain, getting there had wore him out. I'll never forget when we opened this church and everybody celebrated, man, and it was like a celebration day. And I've still got the video footage of it. And everybody was so happy and so energetic, and I was happy. But I wasn't energetic because getting here had about wore me out. But I couldn't tell nobody that. See, sometimes a dad is so good at being a dad, you just think it's easy. But you don't know old dad. He about wore out. Sometimes your husband's so committed to being strong in your life that he don't tell you that he feels like he's about to snap Himself. Sometimes a mom is so good at loving on you and cooking for you, and she don't tell you that she can't handle not one more thing. Am I talking to anybody in this place? David was tired. David had got to a new level, but when he got to a new level, he found a new devil. The name is Babanob, this giant, means dweller on the mountain. See, there's some things that you fight on the mountain that you don't fight in the valley. And I found that for every new level God brought me to, there was a new devil that I had to deal with. Sometimes the reason people ain't dealing with no devil is they ain't going nowhere. But if you say, I'm going somewhere, you're going to have to fight every now and then. If you say, I'm going to be who God called me to be, a new level, get ready to fight a new devil. And let me remind you that if God got you to it, God will bring you through it. Somebody ought to give him praise right now. Whew. He got there. 
he was tired. You at church today, but you're tired. You look good, but you're tired. And everybody else would have thought that's David being David. David got this. But David had a nephew right down below him that had his back. And everybody needs somebody in life that has your back. And David's nephew down below him that had his back, his name was Abishia which means a gift from God. You need to realize that there are people in your life that are gifts from God Almighty. Don't take them for granted. Let me help you with life. What you celebrate, you draw close to you. What you dishonor, you push far away from you. And so many times I've, tr I've seen God try to bless somebody through bringing people into their life and then push them away. You expect a blessing to be an angelic being coming down from heaven. It might just be your brother. It might just be your nephew. Nephew. It might just be that person sitting beside of you right now. I want you to give God a praise for the people that are still in your life. Woo. A lot of people had walked away from David, but Abishia said, I won't walk away from my uncle. I love my uncle. I know his place in God. And when Israel looks at David, David gives them hope. David is the light of Israel. David is the one that reminds them that God slays giants. David is the one that reminds them that praise drives back depression. David is the one that reminds them that God can do a big work with a small thing like a rock. David is the one that reminds them that even when you make a mistake, God Almighty can forgive you and pick you back up. David was the light of Israel. When you looked at David, you saw the testimony of the Lord. I want it to be that when people look at me, they give God glory because they say ain't no way Barry could do it if it had not been for the Lord that was on his side. Am I talking to anybody? That when they look at Cody, they say look at the touch of God on his life. God put you on planet earth to be a light in a darkened world, not to hide your light under a bushel, hide your testimony in a basket. Every time David walked by, he was a reminder of the goodness of God. He was a reminder of the power of God. He was a reminder of the faithfulness of God. But because Abishia, the gift, knew him, he could tell stuff about him that the average passerby couldn't tell. He could tell that on this particular day, his hero was whew, tired. Oh, so tired. Everybody else said, oh, he's good. He's David. He's got this. But Abishia knew how to recognize something that the common person walking by couldn't recognize. Abishia said, there's something wrong with David. He ain't moving like he moved in that last battle. He ain't swinging like he used to swing. He ain't, he ain't bobbing like he used to bob. David looks like he's in trouble, and if you study it out, it's because he was the son of David's sister, Zariah. Her name means wounded. He grew up, Abishia grew up in the house of David's sister, his mother, and her name meant wounded. That's not in the Bible by accident. Abishia learned how to recognize when somebody was wounded, when somebody was tired. It used to be in the 1950s and the 1960s that if a soldier came home with all their body parts intact, they said they come home unharmed. But then they noticed that those soldiers, even though they weren't missing fingers or legs or they had their eyes and they hadn't been blown up, they couldn't, some of them couldn't function, even though they had all their parts. It didn't look like nothing was broken on the outside, but they begin to realize that you can have everything working on the outside and be broken on the inside. They had a term for those soldiers. They called them the walking wounded. They said they're able to walk, but they're wounded. They had to realize that you can be well physically, but be tore up emotionally by what you've been through to such a degree that you can't function the way you used to function. Because this gift from God could recognize when his mother was wounded, he could tell when David was wounded. We need to pray for a discernment and a sensitivity in the house of God because church people will fake you out. They'll say, I'm good, I'm blessed, I'm highly favored, all the way to a nervous breakdown. But I'm believing for a fresh anointing from God to baptize the church that we begin to sense when each other is hurting when we begin to know each other good enough to say brother you look like you're struggling I got your back since you don't seem like you got it like you need to I'm going to help you now the Bible said that the dweller on the mount 
this evil giant brother of Goliath, he wanted payback. And ain't that just like the enemy? He wants to get payback for every victory God's wrought in your life. And nothing would have pleased him more than when he drew that new sword on David to have slid him in half, to have cut his head off. Same devil, new sword. Same enemy, new sword. Philistine giant, nothing new about that. But the sword he was using was new. You and I are living in a time where the same devil that's fought people from ages and eons past. He's still fighting. But in 2020, he pulled out a new sword. He pulled out stuff we had never seen before. We had never seen a man lay there with a knee on his neck until he quit breathing. We had never seen a virus like this come forth and try to wipe people out and make people afraid to hug and embrace each other. We had never seen our nation as divided as it has been in this last presidential election. I found out it's the same devil, but he's pulled out a new sword. And I may be preaching to some people right now that you're fighting the same enemy, but you say, preacher, He's fighting me in a different way than he fought me a year ago. He's fighting me in a different way than I've ever fought before. I'm feeling worse than I've ever felt. I'm feeling more hopeless than I've ever felt. I feel more like giving up than I've ever felt like giving up before. It's because the same devil has drawn a new sword on you. And Abishia, because he realized David was in trouble, he said, don't you worry, Dave. I got this one for you. I feel all right. And every now and then you're going to need some brothers and sisters in Christ that we you don't think you can make it they say don't worry brother I got your back I'm praying for you you can talk to me we gonna make it through this together and Abishia said you may not feel like fighting him but I do and he went to the top of that mountain and he slew that giant on behalf of his uncle I'm praying for some giant killers to raise up in this church I'm tired of people living alone I'm tired of people dying alone we need to have each other's back I thought somebody get behind that kind of preaching this morning. Abishia said, I can tell you don't feel it. Like you used to feel it, Dave. But I got you, uncle. I got you. Other people might have judged you and let you fall, but I ain't letting you go down like that because your very life gives the entire nation of Israel hope. I'm going to fight your battle. I'm going to stand in the gap for you. I'm going to help you any way that I can. And he slew that giant. Can I tell you that you are somebody's light? You give somebody hope. I don't care what the devil has told you and he's focused you on the people that don't like you, that don't believe in you, that have walked out of your life. Somebody needs you to make it. Somebody needs you to survive. And Abishia realized that if David went down on that mountain, the light for Israel would have been quenched. The enemy loves to take out a believer so that the light goes out. I'm in church, but the light's out. Pack my Bible, as most of you didn't, but my light's out. I'm married, but the light's out. The enemy ain't got to kill you if he can just move you into a place of isolation to where you're the only voice you're hearing. Listen, the worst place I can be is alone by myself all the time because I can't tell me nothing that I don't already know. That's why you got to have outside voices. And the enemy, what we've seen in the natural is a copy, a photocopy of what's been going on in the spirit. The enemy's been trying to get people alone get them weary, afraid to talk to people, afraid to interact, afraid if they showed people what was really going on inside of them, that they would walk away from them and get them in that alone, vulnerable moment. Then nobody's there to have their back and the enemy takes them out. But Abishia understood what it was like to recognize when someone is wounded. Don't you ever judge somebody's praise. When you see them lift up those hands and tears streaming down their face, you don't know how they've been wounded. You don't know what they had to fight just to get here this morning. 
You don't know every excuse and every reason life gave them to check out and give up, but yet they are still here. So therefore, instead of judging them for how they praise God, you ought to jump in and praise God with them. Because if he'd have brought you through what he'd have brought them through, you'd be giving him a praise right now also. I need everybody to stand to your feet and give God a praise. Praise him for your brothers. Praise him for your sisters. Praise him for the people that are in here. Just remain standing right now, walking wounded. Soldiers would come back, arms, legs, limbs, everything intact, but they couldn't function on the job. Their hands would begin to shake, not because of where they are, but because of where they had been. They labeled it PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Did you know you don't have to be a soldier to go through PTSD? Traumatic events in your life can bring those same psychologists have proven what the Bible already told us. That's why David said, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old. If the enemy can lock you up in, in yourself and you keep silent, that thing just keeps on rolling in you and growing in you and your strength begins to dissipate. And your hope begins to fade. And fear begins to just captivate your entire life. These soldiers were called the walking wounded because though they appeared to be all right, something was not all right. And did you know that they've done studies and they found out that when soldiers get back to the America, American soil, that's when the PTSD kicks in. And they found out it's not because they saw their buddy was blown up. It's not because they saw horrific things that they saw. It's because in the army and in the military, they had a brotherhood. They had each other's back. But then they come back to the land of the free and the home of the brave, and they see people in Walmart, but ain't nobody got nobody's back. And they feel so alone because they say, at least when I was in the service, I had my brothers. I had my soldiers I, I could talk to. That brotherhood's what keeps them together when they're over there fighting. But then when they come home, they don't feel like nobody's really got their back. And they begin to fall apart. I'm preaching to people right now that life is trying to make you fall apart. You, my friend, are spiritually walking wounded. People will look at you and say, what a beautiful lady. What a precious young man. I saw my Aunt Doris the other day in Food City, she's so pretty, she just shines wherever she is. She had that big old smile on, and I was blowing my horn at her, and she waved. And I thought, people that don't know Doris would say, every hair's in place, everything looks so good. They don't know that it wasn't all that long ago. She had to bury her precious husband, Uncle Buford. You can't tell what somebody's going through by what you see on the outside. You don't know how bad they've been hurt. You don't know how bad they're hurting. You don't know that emotionally they may feel like this. A man can stand there like this on the outside because that's how we raised. But he can feel like this on the inside. And it may not happen today, and it may not happen tomorrow, but if that man don't find a brother, if that man don't find a place, if that man don't find somebody that loves him enough to be real with, what's manifesting on the inside, it's going to pop out. It may pop out in a DUI. It may pop out in an overdose. It may pop out in an illicit affair, but it's going to pop out. That's why I say we deal with it here before it ever gets to that point. Let's praise God and believe him for the walking wounded that are among us right now. You see Cody playing a guitar with his dapper hair and his skinny jeans. I gotta mess with him. He said, that boy ain't never had a problem. But those of you from this house know what he's been through, what his mama's been through, what his family's been through. But God gave him people like Taylor 
And he gave him brothers and sisters in Christ that stood with him. So the average passerby would look at him and say, that guy holding that guitar, he don't understand pain. If there's anybody on this stage that understands pain, he does. But he found out you can praise God through the pain and get to the promise he has for you. I want somebody to know you can praise God through the pain to get to the promise that he has for you. Somebody's between pain and promise, and God is moving on you right now. I feel my help coming in here. Lift those hands all over this place.